the frontal lobe is tied into emotion and inhibition and things like that. So when somebody, one of your buddies has too many beers and he's naked on the table with a lampshade on, that's frontal and cerebellar inhibition. They, they lose those inhibitory systems. So they start thinking, yeah, this is a good idea. Hold my beer kind of thing. So, so we want to do stuff to make those inhibitory systems stronger. And so that, that, you know, your whole brain is a gas break analogy. You have to have a go system, but you have to have a stop system. So we also did some stuff with you like anti saccades and dual tasking and whatnot. And what those are is that if anyone's played the game, Simon says, go, Simon says, stop, go. Well, that's, for, you know, our tendency is to want to go, right? And, to, you know, you have to have that inhibitory system to say, oh, Simon didn't say. And so we use that, like we do a lot with neurodevelopmental stuff with like autistic kids and things like that. So those are just examples of those inhibitory systems of the brain that even though there's not as many neurons for it, they actually have more energy in their own system and those kind of things. And that's why a lot of people have anxiety and OCD. Because yeah, they don't ADD. get it turned off. It doesn't shut exactly. down. Yeah. So we'll do exercises like anti saccades and go, no, go like Simon says stuff and things like that to activate those pathways to get that those pa pathways stronger. Because anything you do repetitively in the brain, like learning a new golf swing, that will ultimately start to create new pathways. And then over time, when you've reinforced it enough, that's your new normal. That's yeah. the beauty about brain plasticity. As long as you're living and breathing, you can you can be 85 years old and get your brain function working better. So it's a it's a beautiful thing that we have going for us on that front. You can always rehab the brain. Um, we also worked with gaze stabilization too. What part does gaze stabilization have um, on how someone feels, and what would reduce somebody's ability to have that gaze stabilization? And um, and then and then I th found it totally fascinating to understand just how sort of exhausting that probably was to my system because my eyes didn't stay focused. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a great question because the, the gaze holding centers in your brain stem. And it happens to be right by where the vagus nerve is. Actually, they're right next to each other. And it's so probably, are they correlated or are they just they, next to each other? Exact, for sure okay. they're correlated. Well, technically the whole nervous system, even though we try and compartmentalize it, there's a lot of interconnectivity. So I don't want to be, you know, like left brain, right? But at the end of the day, they're like brother and sister right next to each other. Because gaze centers are your part of your balance center. Okay, the main part of gaze holding is your balance center. It's the fastest reflex in the human body. It's faster than vision. So our ability to look at a target and move our eyes or head around, I'm sorry, move our head around that target, fastest reflex of the human body. One of the things we see a lot in concussions and whatnot is because that's in the brainstem. Well, if your head's getting rattled around as you're, you know, say you're in your NASCAR, or your uh, cart open wheel, and you take a head or even just the, you know, normal driving experience, that, sure. where's the brain? It's floating around in that fluid, but what's it floating on? Your brain stem. So that poor area of the brain is getting a lot of trauma and a lot of shearing and things like that. So one of the mechanisms is actual direct mechanical damage to that area. Well, that's our eyes are basically, if I took your brain and just squeezed it out of your skull and it popped out, that's your eyes. Okay? You can basically with eye movements and eye uh, analysis see a lot, no pun intended, you can analyze a lot of what's going on in the brain based on eye movements and optics and ocular motor stuff. So one of the first things we look at in things like post-concussion is can the eyes lock on a target and stay on that target? And mm -hmm. if they can't, we, that's one of our first orders of business is to do gaze holding exercises uh, or what's, what are called vestibular ocular therapies to get the eyes stable so that your balance is better. Your awareness of where you are in space, your reaction time is better. You don't fall. That's a big thing. What do they tell you in yoga? If you're doing a balance pose like tree, and yeah. you're all over the place, they, your yoga instructor will tell you to lock and fixate on a target. Exactly, your drishi. Yes, exactly. So that's your gaze holding centers. So one of our first building blocks, like when we build your nervous system back up, you have to be able to um, have those eyes locked in place. So we worked a lot with you to develop that foundation so that everything else we did above it was coming from a good foundation like that. What is the normal amount of eye movements in a day? Something 102,000? Yeah, so you know, estimates are around 100 to 120,000 kind of thing. And you were probably doing about four or 500,000 eye movements a day because of all of your extraneous activity and, re, you know, corrections and stuff. Yeah. You know, just your eyes are skeletal muscle. If I'm at the gym and I had you do three sets of 10 with bicep curls and you're like, I can't do anymore. I got lactic acid. I'm tired. And I say, you know what? Do five more 
of the five more sets of those. What do you think your muscles going to do? Right. What do you think your body is going to do? That's anaerobic respiration. It's, you know, you're building up, you know, ta- you know, free radicals. It's exhausting. You're using up yeah. energy unnecessarily. So we want the nervous system to be efficient. And by getting all those extraneous eye movements out of your equation, your system is going to have a lot more energy to work with to do all the fun stuff you like to do. So. Let's talk about uh, stress, diet, lifestyle, um, emotions, um, toxins, like how, is there a way to organize it in a hierarchy or is it, are they all sort of in their own silo affecting the system to a similar degree? I love that question because they do have their, all their own damning qualities about it. But I, if I were to try and put a hierarchy on it, I would say one thing, stress is the underpinning for a lot of our problems. And it whacks those areas of the brain, like the hippocampus, your memory center. One of the worst ways you can whack that is stress. So we have to get stress out of our system. We have to get you know into whether it's our relationships, our careers, whatever. Yeah. You know, finding ways to go ground, go Family, look at practice. You know, whatever, go look at practice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, for sure. That's a big one. The next one I would say is move. You have to move. You know, they've they've done studies, and I just put a new one up in my slide that they just came out with a study where they compared diet and exercise together. They compared that in relation to exercise alone, diet and lifestyle, like the nutrition stuff alone, and then none of the above. And what they showed is that if you exercised, you could overcome the dietary stuff with the negative qualities of diet. Now, I don't want to just give people the green light to go eat. Hey, you know, yeah, like, but it's just a, it's just a hierarchy. Yeah. So get out and move. We become way too sedentary. I don't what care. What kind of movement want. is there? A, is there a certain recommended? Do you need to work at like, do you need to have interval style training? Is it uh, uh, time under tension with muscles, with lifting weights? Is it just purely walking? Like, what, what would yeah. you recommend? I, at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm okay with just getting out and walking. Because if somebody's just sitting at their desk all day and they get out and walk, that's going to be a game changer. But you brought up an excellent point. High intensity interval training is arguably the best way to get new nerve growth factors and insulin resistance under control and things like that. So if we, and the good thing about HIIT training is like, they just did a study that showed five minutes of that or six minutes technically could help prevent Alzheimer's. So when pa- patients tell me, I don't have time to work out. If you can't give me three minutes of your day, you know, then what it, What are you supposed to do as a doctor, as a patient? You know, you give me three minutes of high intensity interval training, and that's going to make huge changes in your brain, in your chemistry, in your neural health. So what we do with high intensity interval training is one minute on, one minute off, one minute on, and we do that times three minutes. That It could be jump rope. It can be elliptical trainer, whatever it, whatever it is you're doing, just do it in, in training and intervals. Even if you're going for a walk, change, go really brisk for a while and then slow it down and change it up that way. Complex movement patterns, big, like yoga, tai chi, there you go. So new things, novelty is big for the brain. Learning oh, a new yeah, instrument. You know, a new golf it. swing or learning how to, you know, play tennis or exactly. whatever. Anything that learn how to play the piano, like anything that stimulates the brain is helps with that neuroplasticity, correct? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, new, no so, neuro new neural pathways. Now, they, you brought up some really big points, though, like toxins and viruses and stuff. Those things will just, you know, you have to be able to address those and, and get them under control and or get them out of the body. So we look at, you know, heavy metal readings like hair analysis and different things like that, urine analysis. We Viruses are like you talk about a major underpinning. This is why a lot of long COVID people are showing dementia stuff. Is that now that it's going along, we're seeing some of the, the effects of that. So we need to do stuff to to address the immunology. And that's why lasers are so good, because they can actually go after a lot of the stuff that the pathogens like viruses are doing to the brain in a mm. bad way. The inflammation, the overimmune response, like the overinflammation that the, you know, you hear about the, the COVID storm and all that stuff. But so yeah, we have if you if you have a chronic mold exposure or something, good luck having a healthy brain. But in, I can say the exact same thing in a even worse, like an iron deficiency. If you're anemic, you're never going to have, you know, it's almost impossible to have a healthy body. If iron is involved in every enzyme react, reaction in the human body. So we had to also do low hanging fruit stuff like a CBC, get labs done on yourself, you know, yeah. eat good foods that have good iron sources like good red meat. This is a yeah. big misconception is that people are like, oh, meat's bad. 
yeah, West, you know, when you have industrialized beef, not good. And it's not the meat that's the problem. It's what they put into it. The antibiotics, sure. um, food sources, fish, we can't live without it. They're called essential fatty acids for a reason. So even if uh -huh. you don't want to eat red meat, all right, let's at least eat, be a pescatarian. Yeah. You, know, you got to at least eat fish or have a fish source like for your omega-3 fatty acids. So that's a big one. So, um, so I would say movement, um, stress reduction, and find a practitioner that's more holistic and integrative that's actually going to look under all of those stones. What do you make about uh, people just kind of dropping dropping to the ground these days like you know the football player that the football player that you know the bills player that um fell down on the field you look at you see all these little videos of people they're soccer players there's people giving speeches there's people on television it's basically like just people doing what they're doing and you just watch them like does that have to do with i mean that seems very brain oriented yeah. And, and while they're actually, this one does get down a little bit more to the cardiovascular level. Like huh. one of the top cardiologists I know said, we are seeing more signs of myocardial. He's, he's, he's been in practice over 30 years. He said, I'm seeing more signs of, of, of cardio, like myocardial inflammation yeah. in the last couple of years. than I've seen in 30 years of practice. Hmm. Okay. Now, you know, where what is smoke, myocarditis? It's the inflammation of the cardiac tissue. Oh, any, okay. Yeah. Any well, itis, that? Yeah. Well, okay. So it's like, we get into this whole thing. I, uh, what I try and do is have a pragmatic conversation about vaccines. All right. I'm sorry, but there is risk involved in vaccines. That's just the nature of the beast. And the problem is you can't, you know, if you start to kind of address vaccine risks, you get censored. Like, look at what happened to Robert Malone. He's like the oh, mRNA really? guy. And as soon as he- Thank God for up, Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, here you've got a guy that literally got shut down, all he was doing was trying to have a pragmatic conversation saying, look, there are risks involved and we don't know everything that's going to happen with the mRNA, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, it, and I'm seeing, you know, vaccine injuries more than I ever have. And most mm -hmm. of it is cardiovascular based. So, you know, endothelial inflammation and things like that, as well as dysautonomia, both in COVID and with the vaccine. What that is, you've heard of conditions like POTS, and things like that. That happens in the brainstem. And that's where, because we talked about, remember we just talked about how the eyes and the balance center were directly brother and sister to your yeah. cardiac, like your vagal yeah. nerve stuff and things like that. Yeah. And that area gets hit hard with a lot of these things. It even gets hit hard with mold, for example. And so then what happens is people have problems when they go to stand up, they don't have the right blood pressure. They don't have the right heart rate. And so you could imagine what's happening to their system when it's going all over the map because you only have about four and a half liters of blood. And that brainstem that we're talking about, it's like a traffic cop says, OK, Danica's standing up, blood, you go here. Danica's leaning forward, blood, you go here, that kind of thing. OK, we're, we're having a thought, you, blood, you go here. Well, if it's getting mixed signals or like with a concussion or it's inflamed and it's not it's your, your not functioning stuck. properly, like if you yeah. have inflammation, like let's say in your core, it's not going to go to your head as well because it's essentially like a like a traffic jam. If you like this clip and you want to hear the whole episode, click at the bottom of your screen.